Hello Year 3, welcome back, Chapter 22, Part B. No one is permitted to leave the lift, explained the second drone, a tall girl who played in goal for the school hockey team and looked like it. I must be allowed to pass. I have a message for Lord Nectar, continued Fuzzface. See, this is the real problem with brainwashed slaves. There's no middle ground, you see. Attack the intruder, decided the third drone, which was a real mistake. I am a servant of Nectar, said Fuzzface. If you attack me, you are an enemy of Nectar. I will destroy enemies of Nectar. Well, you can see where this is leading, can't you? Fuzzface attempted to move the third human drone, blocking the way using his force field capability, slamming his back against one of the pot plants and knocking him unconscious. The first drone, Fisher, responded to this by attacking Fuzzface with his own capability. This was optimistic, though, as his capability was making tiny purple flowers appear out of thin air. Fuzzface was blasted in the face by a jet of blossoms, but hit back with another force field, which knocked Fisher out as well. The final guard, the hockey goalie, ran at him and used her own capability, her rock-hard hands, to smash him backwards into the lift. Unfortunately, she smashed him into the control panel, which meant the doors closed on her, clumping her mind control helmet between them. She pulled backwards instinctively, wrenching the helmet from her head. She too fell to the floor unconscious. At that moment, the side door opened and Nicholas Knox cautiously poked his head out. He surveyed the three unconscious students in the room before gingerly peeking into the lift. Fuzzface lay on the floor, snoring loudly underneath the sparking lift control panel. Suddenly Knox realised he had no hope of fighting whatever forces were now ranged against him. Who on earth had managed to disable such powerful slaves? It was time to abandon his nectar plans and regroup. His brain was fizzing with new ideas, none of which would involve a crazy wasp. He couldn't wait to get started. He who fights and runs away, thought Knox to himself, lives to fight another day. So he ducked back through the door to his private office, office grabbed a few things before murmuring to himself, who who stays and takes a chance ends up in an ambulance. Outside the main door to Ribbon Robotics, Murph, Billy and Hilda high-fived each other delightedly. Billy, you did it, enthused Murph. I know, replied Billy, grinning so widely it looked like he'd inflated his own mouth. Did you see me, Hilda? It was amazing. I blew corned beef's head up, like a, like a massive blow-up head. He shouted up to the two silhouetted heads that were peering down from the roof. Did you see it, Mary? Mary had indeed seen. She and Nellie had rushed to the edge of the roof and looked down, watching with their hearts in their mouths, corned beef boy had stomped around the lorry towards their friends. Nellie had just been about to try and summon more lightning when they'd seen Billy flick out his right hand, as if throwing a frisbee, and then their enemy's heads expanded. They'd watched as the helmet had been catapulted into the air, landing some distance away on the wet concrete and smashing. Corned beef had slumped to the ground unconscious, and then came Billy's even more impressive dispatch of Frankenstein's nephew, which had actually made Nellie clap her hands with pride. Before the remaining two guards had time to react, Mary had then swung into action. She had picked up the still fizzing umbrella skeleton, carefully using her yellow scarf to stop it electrocuting her, held it over to the edge of the roof and dropped it. She used the yellow lights of the mind control helmets to aim precisely at the two figures four four floors below. The effect had been quite dramatic. Their helmets had been short circuited by the electrified metal and two remaining guards were now crumpled on the floor out cold. Now, mid celebration, the true implications of this hit Murph. Mary, was that your umbrella? He called, suddenly horrified. Yes, I'm afraid so. That's why we couldn't fly down from the roof. It sort of broke. She laughed a slightly hollow laugh. No more flying for me. Looks like you've got another kid without a cape on the team. Murph felt sure Mary would be devastated at the loss of her umbrella. He experienced an odd mixture of pity and pride that she was hiding it so well. Wait there, he instructed. We're on our way up. He turned to Billy and Hilda. Come on, we've got to keep going. We've got them on the run. They left the darkening courtyard and moved into the reception area which seemed empty and eerie in the yellow emergency lightning. This way, I think, said Murph, leading them towards the revolving doors. Wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? said a mean voice. It was Patsy, the receptionist. Um, we're going to the lifts, said Murph, figuring that honesty was the best policy. What? Not without signing in? 
demanded Patsy angrily. She gestured at a large book on the desk. Nobody gets through without signing in. Of course, said Ma. Uh, Hilda, would you mind signing us in with this nice lady, please? Patsy McLean had never been called a nice lady in over 17 years. The ghost of a dead smile lingered about her pinched mouth for a fraction of a second as Hilda scribbled their names in the book. Purpose of visit. Hmm. How do you spell thwart? Mm, just put stop, suggested Billy. All right, thanks, said Hilda gratefully. She stuck out her tongue as she wrote in the purpose of the visit column. Stop, evil wasp guy, rescue school and save the day. Oh, thank you, said Patsy, handing them laminated cards with visitors on them. In a flash, the Super Zeros were off through the revolving doors, which worked far better during a power cut because they could just push them. Are the lifts out of order? shouted Patsy after them. I heard it explode about a minute ago. I take the stairs. Murph, Billy and Hilda sprinted up several flights of stairs and found a fire door right at the top. They opened it by pushing on a bar and let Mary and Nellie in. There was a brief burst of triumphant dancing about as the five superheroes were reunited. Right, let's find out what's waiting for us, said Murph, pointing to the door that led to the main building. A sign beside it read, Full floor, strictly no access to any personnel without top level security clearance. But nobody ever got to be a hero by taking notice of signs. There was an electronic pad beside the door where usually you'd need to swipe a security pass. But with the power of Murph simply gave the door a push and it swung open. The Super Zeros found themselves in a white room decorated with potted plants and unconscious teenagers. Just as they entered through one door, someone came in through another, a smaller door off to one side. It was a man with a sharp nose and carefully arranged hair, dressed in a brown coat and carrying a broom. Uh, don't attack me. I'm not part of this monster's plans, please. I'm just a humble cleaner, he explained. What's been going on here? demanded Murph, pointing to the slumped forms of the guards. He took them over with mind control helmets. That monster, replied the man, shifting his way around the wall towards the door to the stairs. Are you part of the rescue mission? Your main strike force must have come through already. What powers do they have? He asked, suddenly leaning towards them curiously. Where do their powers come from? Never you mind, interrupted Mary. Do you know where that wasp guy is now and where he's holding our friends? From that school, asked the man, dressed as a cleaner. In his tower, of course, they're all in his tower. Prisoners at the bottom, and you'll find Nectar right at the top. He'd finally reached the door to the stairwell, and before anyone could think twice, he'd gone through it, shouting, Make sure you don't let him get away! Over his shoulder as he pounded off down the stairs. He had usually shiny shoes for a member of the domestic staff, Hilda thought. Leave him. Whoever he is, we don't have time, said Murph. Get the helmets to these ones. Together... They prize the mind controls from the unconscious. And here's the cleaner. He looks rather familiar, doesn't he? Then all five superheroes crept cautiously into the corridor and led to the glass-walled boardroom and beyond, where Nectar's lair waited for them. And that's the end of chapter two. Bye-bye. <laughs>